Hello, welcome to the Roto World Baseball Show. I'm your host, Eric Samolski, joined as always by Scott Pianowski. It is the day before opening day. Uh, Scott and I are excited, and when we're excited, we're going to just say some bold things and we're going to make some bold predictions on today's podcast. Yeah, man, we got games tomorrow. A season's finally here. I, I don't know how spring training gets longer and longer every year, Eric, but we made it. We did. Yeah, yeah I know the Dodgers and Padres played two games. I, opening day is Thursday, and I'm going to be in front of a TV watching baseball and baseball and more baseball, and I'll sprinkle no. in some basketball at night. But it's a glorious day, and I still have some drafts coming up too. So um, you can apply well, the bold predictions we give today. You can just use them for fun. You can put them in the back of your mind or – you want to play a prop, you, you have a draft coming up, use them any way mm-hmm. you want. You use them responsibly. I, I just hope we get a couple of these right, but this is always one of the most fun days of the year. I mean, we're doing bold predictions today. We get a full slate of games tomorrow. Yeah. I, I'm jacked. Yeah, my last draft was last night. Um, I did an OC, and then we had the Roto World staff draft. Um, and so I'm all wrapped up. I'm just thinking about tomorrow. Um, as you mentioned, Bold predictions are meant to be fun, right? If, if Scott and I are making predictions that we thought would be 100% accurate, uh, we wouldn't be saying some of the things we're going to say. But the idea is to highlight, you know, players we like, teams we are, you know, we like or we are concerned about. Um, and so understand that we either – these predictions will will hint at players we like or teams we like, but they're not exactly to be taken as, as the letter of the law. Um I did want to highlight a couple of things, news-related items, um, as we start. News broke just this morning. Uh, Matt McClain, we finally know what the diagnosis is for Matt McClain. He had a torn labrum. Um, He underwent surgery, just like real um, on the hush-hush. And he is, they hope he will be back at some point this season. Um, But the timeline is TBD. So I guess my question for you, you have a draft tonight. Um, some people, you know, in leagues that do like Wednesday, Sunday waivers, some people have waivers running tonight before opening day. Are you drafting Matt McClain and putting him on the IL? Are you holding Matt McClain and putting him on the IL if you drafted him or are you just cutting and moving on? This is probably the core tenant of my fantasy strategy is that it's not fun to say it, but injury optimism is not your friend. Yeah, and when you have this type of injury, you have to. I, I I say this with zero joy. I buried Matt McLean into an undraftable part of my rankings. Mm-hmm. I, I will not draft him. I will not look at him. And it's no fun. He's a you know he's a he's a guy who could potentially be a five category player. He's a really fun player last year. But at least the bright side here is it cleans up the Reds lineup a little bit, and it makes Jonathan India easier to draft right. and. I've been getting a lot of Spencer Steer this year, who's supposed to hit third. He qualifies at like 17 different positions. I still think it's a really fun team because we've talked about Ellie Dela Cruz so long. I, I feel like his career is about to end, but it's really just getting started. But plenty of Reds I'm interested in. You can't draft Matt McLean. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I am debating holding on to him in one league that's a keeper league. Um, and all other leagues, I, I will I will move on. Um, you know, I think if we see him at all, it's probably like later in the summer. Um, and I just get worried about, you know, TBD timelines. We just don't know. Um, we do know Paul Sewold um, is sidelined with a grade, a grade two oblique. Um, you know, he's going to miss a few weeks. He's going to not throw for a few weeks and he's going to have to ramp up, uh, then get back into games. You're looking at maybe a month um, of Paul Sewold out. Uh, Kevin Ginkle, appears to be the next man up with the Diamondbacks. Curious, what is your interest level in Ginkle, and are you willing to draft Paul Sewold and put him on your bench in certain formats? Um, or, again, if you did already draft, would you cut him, or are you just keeping him on your bench? Too valuable to cut, but I'm not going to draft Seawall tonight because injuries are going to find you, and we saw it all during spring training. So many pitchers getting hurt, so many players getting hurt, but it seemed like pitcher injuries were the big foundation of that, and – Who's to say if Ginkle pitches well? I mean, Paul Seawald isn't Mariano Rivera. It's He's only been with the team a short time. It's not like he's promised anything into the future. I mean, my uh, old podcast mate, Michael Salfino, used to say relief pitchers are like French fries. They're great when they're hot and they eventually go cold and you have to throw them away and get new fries. And I don't mean to be, um, you know, smug or or glib about these guys that are human beings and everything. But, you know, Paul Seawald was just a guy a few years ago and he found it and he's, he's in his thirties. Now he's a good player. He's not some irreplaceable player. I, it also shows you that 
Eric, you can draft a team and think you're light on saves, and then guys are going to come out through injury, through attrition. Players will lose their jobs. Contending teams can't mess around if the ninth inning goes south. They have to trade for somebody or promote somebody or make a change. So there's always going to be saves you can find. We weren't talking about Kevin Ginkle all during the preseason, and he was mm-hmm. undrafted in just about every one of my leagues. But you know, here's a guy who – and here's the thing with Ginkle, right? If you pick him up, if he even gets like five or six saves, that's a win. Right, he doesn't need to do all that much. We always talk about this with saves and steals. The barrier is very low to clear. You're asked to do one thing, and if you do that one thing, that manager will keep pressing the button. So, I wish I had a little bit more ginkle than I have now. Sure. Price has gone up, and it's you know you have to kind of elbow people out of the way. But you can always, even in competitive leagues, saves are going to come into the league, and I don't sweat it. If I look at a team post draft and say, "Oh, you know, I, I'm not the strongest in saves," I don't want to completely punt it. I'm not going to do that, but. Right, I'm one of the weaker bullpens. I'm like, well, I, I can fix this. Is fixable. I'm gonna have to yeah. maneuver people, and other people want Kevin Ginkle too. Or whoever comes out, you know, their Washington's closer situation is nebulous. We don't know if Oakland will win any games, but if they do, who's their closer? Who's the White Sox closer? Maybe Michael Kopech has a nice career change now. But you can always find some saves. You just gotta, you know, roll up your sleeves and get to work. Yeah, and and for those who don't know the name Kevin Ginkle, like he was pretty good for the Diamondbacks mm-hmm. last year. He's not like a oh they're just finding some random eighth inning guy to put in the back of, of the bullpen. Um, he can be a solid closer for you in your fantasy leagues. He is worth picking up. He is worth drafting. This isn't like you know walking a minefield where you hope you get some saves, but you're also going to get a five ERA from you know somebody at the back of a bullpen. Um, I would. I would keep Paul Sewald if I had IL spots. Um, you know, I, I think he is valuable, and I think he will come back to at least the majority of, of that save share. Um, but as you mentioned, like those spots dry up. I'm in a Yahoo league that has four IL spots, um, and they, they all filled immediately. Uh, granted, like you know, that's including guys like Matt McLean, who I I won't put in the IL spot with. But you know, uh, Brian Wu is now going to be in one of those spots. Um, it was an earlier draft, so like Robert Stevenson is now going to be in one of those spots. So th- there are leagues where like you see that that fill up pretty quickly. Um, so you know you don't want to take on too many injured players, but I think Paul Seald is worthy of a, a spot if you have an IL spot. It's also a um, good reminder, by the way, that when you drafted your team, the IL spot guys and people are always bugging us about this, and there's nothing I can do to control it. Guys <laughs> don't get put on the IL right to, yes. in Yahoo until the team does it. But teams are doing this now. They're setting their final roster. So this is when you want to go to Yahoo or whatever provider yeah. you're using and start going to the waiver wire. Because this is – I can't say this enough, by the way. The early waiver period is so critical. And I, I have to – you know, Eric, I calendar everything or I'd forget. I almost forgot that we were taping an hour early today <laughs> for, for crying out loud. But I get to put things in my calendar and set reminders because, you know, we're all in a million leagues and they all have different free agent cadences. And one common mistake, I say mistake, it's like an oversight that people make. And I I do, this happens to me too. There'll be one league where I'll forget that the fab is running at an unusual time in the first week. And I might miss out on something. I might miss out on those IL stashes and and getting the mortification I need on my bench. I I can't say it enough how important it is to really be hyper-focused. I mean, look, I want you to focus all season, but it's six months. I get it. You know, eventually football is going to creep in. Your kids will go back to college, whatever. You know, maybe you'll go back to college. Your <laughs> life is dynamic. You're having a child. You're moving, whatever it is, changing jobs. But if there's really one time I, I want you to be super hyper-focused, it's like the first couple of weeks. And part of that yeah. is understanding what the fab cadence is in your league. Right. And I, Scott and I did a, a podcast on Monday where we talked about early season strategies. You, should, you could listen to that. I posted an article this morning um, over on NBC Sports about early season strategies. It covered a lot of the things that Scott and I discussed. So you can check that out if you if you want it in written form. Um, and those are some things to help you on in the early going. Um, Paul Seawold's team, the Arizona Diamondbacks, made a little bit of a splash signing last night um, with Jordan Montgomery going uh to arizona you and i had both been tepid on him um not just because he didn't have a team but because we both kind of felt like his uh playoff success was over that was le- causing him to be overvalued in the fantasy market um now that he has a team are you interested in jordan montgomery where, where are you kind of slotting him for your drafts that you have coming up yeah look at his career stats 3.68 era 1.21 whip 
that's a good pitcher. It's a playable pitcher. That's about what I would expect from Montgomery. Maybe a little bit less than that because he's changing teams. He's changing leagues again. He's, he was with the Cardinals for a while, but he's never pitched in this division. You know, At least the Blake Snell handoff, he goes from – San Diego to San Francisco, but he knows the division. You know, he's pitched in that ballpark a bunch of times. This is a bigger adjustment for Montgomery. He signed later in the cycle. To me, he's like a starting pitcher four in, in like a 12 team league. I wouldn't mind having maybe even a five. I, he would pitch for me every week, or I would probably use him against anybody who's not a, a horrible matchup. But I don't think he's a destination player for me either. It, it, when Snell signed, I think the people who got in on Snell probably felt like, okay, great. Even though Blake Snell is a, such a strange play, pitcher, who wins the Cy Young Award and leads the major leagues and walks in the same season? Right. Blake Snell. And I still don't really know who Blake Snell is exactly. I haven't drafted him at all, even though I, I'm afraid he could beat me. I'm not afraid Jordan Montgomery can beat me. He's a good player, but I don't think his upside is anything significant. I fully agree. Uh, I, I definitely think he's a little overrated in the in the market right now. Um, this is a guy whose strike strikeout rate has gone down significantly in the last few years. He was at 21.8% um, in 2022 and 21.4% last year. That's under eight strikeouts per nine. Um, that, that's not good. He is not like a 200-inning guy, I don't believe. He's only thrown over 180 innings once in his career, so – you're not voluming in the way that like a Logan Webb would volume. He way overperformed um, his metrics last year. I think that 320 ERA is a mirage. He has overperformed his ERA, um, his metrics a little bit in his career, but not much. So in 2021 with the Yankees, he had a 383 ERA, but a 407 Sierra, which is skills independent ERA, which tries to kind of eliminate the stuff pitchers can't control. Uh, in 2022, he had a 350 ERA and a 361 Sierra. So, like, all of those are like the ERA is only slightly better. But last year, he had a 320 ERA and he had a 423 Sierra. Um, it was a full run, his ERA was a full run better than what the advanced metrics suggest he should have done. I think this is a mid to high three ERA pitcher who won't get you a lot of strikeouts on a good team in a really tough division. Um, and so I, I am fine taking a gamble if he's like your starting pitcher four. Um, but I, I don't, I would not be like vaunting him up your rankings. Um, and sure. Like if he wasn't drafted in your league because he wasn't, he wasn't on a team again, I, I think that's highly unlikely, but you can add him. He deserves to be on a team, but I, I would not go crazy here. Interesting trend, right? where Snell and Montgomery both signed late in the cycle and they got short deals. Snell got the two year deal. Montgomery got the one year deal. And we, again, we talked about how many pitchers were hurt this spring training. I think teams are finally coming around to this idea, even with coveted. I mean, Snell just won the Cy Young award for crying out loud. And right. teams don't want to sign pitchers to long-term contracts anymore. And I get it. I mean, it's just, it's so random. It seems like just the, you spin the wheel and you hope that your guys aren't seeing Jim's James Andrews, you know, or, Neil Trash or, you know, whoever the, the different uh, the different surgeons are and stuff like that. And again, I don't mean to be glib about it. These guys are so much fun to watch. Well, and I've drafted actually some of my teams are pitching heavy, too, this year. And I, I really need some of the guys I've drafted, like the Seattle guys. And I, I, thankfully, I didn't have any woo, but I have almost everybody else on that staff. I have a lot of Logan Webb. I'll talk about him in a minute. I need these guys to stay healthy. And I know that there's so much uncertainty to that. I mean, you you always make the comparison to football, but it is a, like a lot of what we're seeing with the running back market too, which is teams don't want to give long second contracts to running backs. They play out their rookie contracts, and then they understand that there is a you know there's a toll that it takes, and you know you can find other guys, and so you're seeing like the Austin Eckler, Saquon Barkley, guys like that who were like you know very vocal last offseason about the running back market. I think we're seeing the same thing with the starting pitcher market, and I don't think it's collusion and i don't think it's like owners you know teaming up against scott boris I, it's I a market it's correction a little bit of, it of, yeah exactly it's a little bit of like we can't keep putting this amount of money into extremely volatile assets you know that the we would we would tell people that in any way that they spend their money in every other walk of life if something is not a given is not secure don't spend tons and tons of money for a long term period of time um, and so we're just seeing that with starting pitchers. Um, there's one other piece of news, which is that 
Victor Scott was called up um, and will start in center field for the Cardinals at the start of the year after the injury to Dylan Carlson. He will come up in one of our bold predictions, so we will talk about that later on in this episode um, if you're wondering why he doesn't get mentioned at the top here. Um, before we get into our bold predictions, a reminder that we are closing in on opening day, but we still have another day to squeeze in a draft. So for those cramming before the regular season begins, grab your Roto World baseball draft guide it's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings projections and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success visit nbcsports.com slash draft guide and use code baseball 24 to get 10 percent off at checkout that's nbcsports.com slash draft guide and use code baseball 24 to get 10 percent off at checkout i will say that even in the first couple of weeks of the season this draft guide is super valuable mm -hmm. because it will have uh, write-ups on all of the players our off-season projections and those things can be really valuable if somebody pops off in the first week and you're like, wait, I don't really, I need to know more about who this player is. You can go back and check some of the articles. And, and Great reference tool. Yeah. You definitely want to use it in season. And also remember over at Yahoo Sports, you can draft into the season. Yeah, I have a league that's yep. going to draft in April. We couldn't get scheduling is one of the peskiest things about fantasy sports. These people have different schedules. So if you, if you missed out or you just want a, a FOMO draft, you know, and there's no wrong way to do this, right? I have one league that's a mixed league, and the manager count is going to be lower this year for different reasons. We're going to switch to AL only. So mm -hmm. we'll tighten the player pool up a little bit. There's no wrong way to play Roto. You want to play – you want to get four people together, have a mixed league, knock yourselves out. You want to play AL only, NL only, we also have that available at Yahoo. So if you want to add one more league, you know, uh, get, pick up the guide, hop over to Yahoo. We'll be happy to serve you. We, we, we will. We'll be happy to work together for your fantasy baseball enjoyment. Um, let's have some fun ourselves. So we're going to start with our bold predictions. We are going to mix in here some hitter bold predictions, some pitcher bold predictions, some team bold predictions. Um, you're going to start off with a team bold prediction. I am. Um, the Yankees, I'm pretty sure we touched on them as an under in the team over under pod that we did with DJ. I don't think that goes far enough. This team could have a losing record. This is, you can call this bold prediction anything you want. You can call it the Yankees finish last in the AL East. You can call it they finish under 500. I think both of those things are in play. Who are the most important players on the Yankees? Garrett Cole. We don't even know if he's going to pitch this year. Aaron Judge. Attrition is going to be part of his second half of his career. He's playing center field. He shouldn't be there. He's already dinged up. I know they added Soto and they had Soto peak peak of powers Juan Soto. I think he's going to have a monster year, but it's going to be walking a million times because you can pitch to the rest of this lineup. We'll see if judge plays 120 games. Glaber Torres is good. And, and I have also another bold prediction. I'm going to give you later about Anthony Volpe, or I guess I could, I could weave it in here, but Gene Carlos Stanton, what are you getting here? 90, hundred games back nine for Anthony Rizzo back nine for DJ LeMahieu. He's already hurt. Look at the bottom of the lineup. Jose Trevino, Cabrera, the, the guys, Alex Verdugo's forever been a tease. Not sure he can hit left-handed pitching. I've grown up with the Yankees being the Bronx Bombers, the team you feared. The lineup's loaded, you know, and all through the Bronx Zoo Yankees. And then, you know, they had Ricky Henderson, Don Mattingly. They were unbelievable. And then, of course, the, the whole Jeter era where they dominated baseball. That team is so dead now. And they, they're set up. They don't want to take on a, a bunch of extra money. They, they were Montgomery made a lot of sense for them actually, and they decided. I, I don't know if they were trying to get Montgomery, but I don't think they want to go over the next luxury tax threshold. Mm -hmm. My friend Joe Sheehan speculated, and he's a Yankee fan by the way, but it doesn't influence his work. He talked about the Yankees maybe being sellers in the middle of the season. And I could see that too. I think it's going to be a down year for New York. Not drafting Cole at any price, really. I'm afraid to take Judge where he goes. He's slipped into the second round of Yahoo drafts. I'm still saying no to Judge. Other than Volpe, who I'll talk about later, I this is a roster I'm avoiding. And, and so my bold prediction is the Yankees are under 500. Uh, I love it. Um, I know that there's still, still some people predicting them to win the division. Um, Crazy. I, d I don't see it. Um, we had a bold predictions article come out a staff bold predictions article come out over at Roto World. Um, I encourage you to check that out just to hear what all the people on the staff were thinking. Uh, my bold prediction in that article was that DL Hall would finish as a top 40 starting pitcher in fantasy. Um, so I'm going to lead off with just that take as well. Um, DL Hall is my most rostered player. Um, so it makes sense that I, I'm, I'm bullish on him. Um, in the NFBC main event drafts, he was the 108th pitcher off the board going pick 260. Um, Obviously, I think he'll wait, outproduce that. Uh, this is a guy with a really good fastball from the left side, 95 miles an hour, gets good extension on it, throws it up in the zone. I think it'll lead to strikeouts. 
He tweaked his slider in the middle of the year last year to add um, it added velocity, but also um, added break. So like downward movement um, while keeping horizontal velocity, the pitch just basically blew up on, on stuff plus metrics in the second half of the year. And I think that will be, a really good offering for him. He does have a plus changeup, which he can use against righties. So I think he has um, a, a good enough pitch mix to work as a starter. He was a start, uh, an elite starting pitching prospect before some injuries, and then also just Baltimore feeling that they could use him more in the bullpen last year. Um, I'm buying shares wherever I can. He is a guy who is available on waiver wires. So um, if he's available on your waiver wire, he's somebody I would add to your bench for this first weekend because I think there's a chance that he looks really good early in the year and then you're going to have to spend tons of money to add him. So he's somebody who I would be looking to add before that potentially happens. I love it. And his global ADP is outside the top 300. Some of my leagues on Yahoo are head-to-head leagues where starting pitching is really important. And also, if you can get a starting pitcher who also has RP eligibility, which Mm -hmm. DL Hall does, that can be a, a really nice hack if a bunch of your pitchers start the same day. Yeah. You can slide somebody into the relief area. I also think in head-to-head formats, maybe punting saves might be more viable. You can, even in head-to-head, punting batting average isn't that bad of an idea because some weeks you're going to win batting average anyway, even if you're a weaker batting average team. So the strategies are a little bit different in a head-to-head format. I love DL Hall, where he's going. And look, when you're taking these late pitchers, when you're taking these lottery tickets and these rookies and these young guys – you're asking yourself, does this guy, can this guy blow up with strikeouts? Does this guy have an elite skill? Does he have a ridiculous ground ball rate? Does he have a ridiculous strikeout rate? In the case of D.L. Hall, I've seen him projected in some places to, to get like 180 strikeouts. That's in play. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think he's I think he's been mispriced the whole season, and I love that you brought him up in this podcast today. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to love the next pitchers <laughs> that you bring up in your bold prediction. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if uh, my next two – well. My, my third bold prediction actually is bold, but my second bold prediction might be a little bit on the softer side. I'm going to say two Mariners are in the top five in Cy Young voting at the end of the year because I, I have Luis Castillo everywhere. I have mm-hmm. um, I have George Kirby everywhere. I have some Logan Gilbert. And so it's, it's not – if you picked any of those guys to win the Cy Young, it wouldn't be a big leap of faith. I think people forget that Seattle's Park is an extreme pitcher-favoring park. They have a good defense behind these guys, and uh, Kirby's the extreme strike thrower. Castillo is more of a missing bats guy, but he's proven to be a horse. I know we we talk constantly, and I talked about earlier, it's just so hard to know who's going to stay healthy among pitchers and who isn't, but Castillo's earned the right to go where he's going. Probably the third round, Kirby probably the fourth round in most Yahoo leagues. I'm occasionally bumping the line on these guys. Uh, This is mostly me wanting to say, if you haven't drafted yet, I think you want a piece of the Seattle rotation. So I, I don't know. This might be the softest of all the quote unquote bold predictions we're giving out. Let me say it this way. Se- Seattle. I mean, this is the best pitching staff in baseball, the best starting staff in baseball. It's not the Dodgers. It's not the Braves. It's the Seattle Mariners. Um, I agree. I mean, obviously it was a little stronger when Brian Wu was, was healthy. Mm-hmm. Emerson Hancock is, is fine. I don't believe that he is the same quality of pitcher. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have tons of shares of Luis Castillo. Um, and so I fully co-sign this. Um, I'm taking a whole team of pitchers here. Uh, you mentioned how good the Mariners rotation is. I think the Detroit Tigers rotation is going to be damn good as well. And I think the Tigers are going to have five guys finish in the top 70 starting pitchers. So if you are playing in a 12 team league, uh, most league, most league formats have nine pitcher slots. Uh, Most of those leagues will then have you start six starting pitchers. Generally speaking, six starting pitchers in a 12 team league is 72 starters. So basically what I'm saying is, the Tigers will have five pitchers that should be started in every 12-team league. Um, starts with Tarek Skubal, uh, who looked great last year and you know has continued to look great in the spring. And I think as long as he's healthy, is going to be a, a top 20 starting pitcher in baseball, potentially top 10. Um, Jack Flaherty looks really good this spring. Um, I think we forget that Jack Flaherty is only 28 years old. Um, I know that he has he came out of the gates really hot in his career and battled some injuries and kind of lost a little bit of his luster. Um, but this isn't like some 34 year old who's making a comeback. Like he still, you know, is on the younger side, and it would not be a shock for him to you know have a little resurrection. 
Uh, Casey Mize won a spot in the rotation. He looks phenomenal in the spring. Um, he was he has changed his pitch mix uh, before after undergoing Tommy John surgery. He also fixed he also had surgery to uh, correct a back injury. He claimed he was pitching through a back injury for a few years, so that has is cleaned up. He's added a four seam fastball, which he's throwing up in the zone a lot, and it just looks great. It's now at like 95, 96. Um, I think Casey Mize is going to be really good. Reese Olsen was good last year as a rookie. He has looked great this spring. Um, I think that he, you know, in the rotation will be um, like a consistent fantasy contributor. And then I'm cheating when I'm say five, because I think there are six really good pitchers for the Tigers. It depends on who stays healthy. Kenta Maeda, yes, he doesn't throw hard, but his secondary stuff has looked really good this spring. And I think that Maeda has always been a usable um, fantasy baseball pitcher. At one point we were drafting him, you know, in like the, uh, you know, in the top 20 of starters. Uh, he's not that anymore, but I think he is a really usable pitcher. And if he doesn't last or he get hurt, he gets hurt. Matt Manning looked great this spring and he didn't win a rotation spot, but if he gets an opportunity, I think he's going to be viable in all fantasy formats. So I think at the end of the year, you're going to look up and five Tigers starting pitchers are in the top seven. I'm here. I know that it. makes you happy. It, it does. Um, you know, I, I grew up in New England, always a Red Sox fan, but I've adopted the Tigers since I've been in Michigan the last couple of decades. Now, unfortunately, the only pitcher here I can pound the table on and say, yes, go, go freaking get him is Tariq Skubal. And it bugs me a little bit that some people are talking about him like he's unknown. He was so good. Right. The last two months last year, that's unseeable. He just needs to stay healthy, and he is a star. And unfortunately, you've had to pay up for him in draft season, but I've been happy to do it. They'd be thrilled if just a couple more guys popped. If Maeda was just you know a playable 3.9 ERA guy, they'd probably take it. I was at the Matt Manning no-hitter last year. It was like the the most nondescript no-hitter anybody's ever seen. I was, I was at a fortunate to get invited to somebody's box and we were talking the fifth or sixth inning. I'm like, you know, they haven't allowed any hits because Manning <laughs> had been in trouble the whole game and the game started late. It was drizzling and everything. But um, yeah, the fact that he doesn't even make this rotation, I would love it if Casey Mize started to pay off that draft pedigree. I would love it if we saw the Jack Flaherty, even like half of the Jack Flaherty. He used to be in his salad days in St. Louis. I guess I'll just throw this in here. Okay. Uh, it, it's later in the rundown, but because it ties into the Tigers, one of my bold predictions is that not only will the Tigers win the AL Central, which is in play, and it's been really priced nicely this preseason. So take if you want to put a couple of bucks on their over-under, they're going to beat that. But my, my bold prediction for them is that they'll be the only winning team in this division. The White Sox aren't close to being relevant. I think the Royals are still several years away. Cleveland, that lineup, it depresses me. That's why I can't draft Jose Ramirez this year. I know they're built on a pretty good pitching staff. We'll see how much of it holds up. They already have some dings there. And Minnesota, we keep talking about this, their entire roster is, oh, I hope we get 125 games from Buxton. Oh, I hope Karloff has a healthy season. Oh, I hope Carlos Correa is the player he was three years ago, not the guy that everybody signed and then walked away from in his contract during his strange year. Everybody talks about the Giants won't sign any big free agents. Maybe the best move they made was signing Correa and then getting out of it because he looks he looks like he's 35 and he's you know yeah. he's like five years younger than that. I, I think he might be. I hate to say this because I don't want to ding the players, but I think Carlos Correa is the most overrated player in baseball right now. Ooh. Detroit's Ooh, winning this division. A... Detroit's going to be over 500. The, twin, the Twins and, and Guardians, and I hope I didn't call them the Indians because I'm, I'm still good. It's still new to me. Uh, new phone, who dis? But Detroit's winning this division, and I think there's a good chance of the only 500 team in this division. This is a soft pillow landing. This is where you stream. This is why, as you said, if Matt Manny enters the rotation because he's pitching against all these teams, you know, the yeah. Royals offense, yeah, that four it goes four deep, and then it's like, well, wow, I can pitch against all these guys. The, the White Sox, I can't believe I loved this team like three or four years ago. It feels like everything they've right. done has, has gone horribly wrong. Has gone backwards. Yeah. yeah so let's um, go. Detroit Tigers 2024. Paul Spore is happy. You mentioned the Giants when you were talking about Correa, but that mm -hmm. is uh it's connected to your next bold prediction. It is. Uh look, Logan Webb's good. We all know that. Is, My whole yeah. prediction is he's going to win 20 games. And this is the guy who won 11 last year. He's never won more than 15. But what does Logan Webb do really well? He go, he goes deep in games because he's efficient. He can get strikeouts, but he's not a quote-unquote strikeout pitcher. But because he doesn't walk anybody. I mean, he led the National League in strikeout to walk ratio last year. You might say, oh, he only strikes out 8.1 batters per nine. He's a soft toss. Well, no, he, he doesn't walk anybody, and he strikes out some guys. He's just not going to strike out the world. And because Logan Webb, and I've said this, I feel like all spring, 
and I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm not James Andrews, of course, not even close to it. I'm not even good at operation or any of that stuff. I didn't watch ER. But because Logan Webb doesn't, he isn't one of these fire-breathing dragon 98, 99 MPH guys. He lives in the lower 90s. I just wonder if that's less strain on the elbow and the shoulder. And, and again, he's efficient. He's a guy, he's going to pitch to contact a lot of the time. That's okay. Then it's got Chapman to play third base, who's just an exquisite defender. It's an extreme pitcher park to the point that you can understand why major hitters, why Bryce Harper didn't want to go there, or Otani, even J.D. Martinez said, look, I don't want to hit in that park. So Logan Webb is, is a destination pick for me. With the wins, where do wins come from? If you're on a competitive team, if you go deep in games. The, the key to getting wins is getting into that seventh inning. And I think Logan mm -hmm. Webb's going to do it as much as anybody in baseball. He led the major leagues in innings last year, and I think he's a good chance to do that. Again, that's where wins come from. And just because wins are hard to find, just because wins are percolating away you know, out of the starting rotations you know, these days, and you can win the Cy Young with a low win total, and that's the game's different now. It doesn't mean yeah. we should just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, wins are a crapshoot, so I'll just – I don't care if my pitchers are on good teams or bad teams. I don't care if they pitch five innings. They're not going to get the win. No, don't think that way. You get wins by going deep in games, and Logan Webb's going to do that. And I think I'll, – I'll, I'll feel crummy if Logan Webb gets hurt in like two or three weeks in part because he's on like half my teams. But I think we found a sweet spot where maybe not throwing Max out, not being one of these guys who – taxes his arm with like 98 99 mph velocity maybe that's the way to go it's it's entirely possible um you mentioned matt chapman also listen i know nick ahmed doesn't like you know give fantasy managers the warm and fuzzies mm -hmm. but he's a very good defensive shortstop um and that will be helpful for logan webb as well logan webb had a 62 percent ground ball rate last year um, so having a really good defense on the left side will, will certainly help him. Um, my last bold prediction for this kind of pitcher focused segment. Um, it's pretty bold. I love this one. I love it. It's my favorite one. The whole uh, rundown. I think I, I, I say that Shota Imanaga will have more fantasy value than Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Um, Obviously, it's easy to lump these two together just because they're the two high profile pitchers who came over from the NPB um, in Japan. And Yamamoto was the big signing for the Dodgers. Um, Imanaga was a, a little bit more of an afterthought, but he, Imanaga had, even though Yamamoto was the quote unquote better pitcher in Japan, he won the Japanese Cy Young, you know, multiple years in a row. Imanaga had more, <clears throat> uh, had a better strikeout rate. Um, Imanaga is a good pitcher. And I think he is on a team where he will get more run. He's 30 years old. Um, the Cubs have way less money invested in him than the Dodgers have in Yamamoto. The Dodgers are a team that, you know, we talk about, you know, Dodgeritis with the pitchers. They, you know, even though, we, you know, Billy Epler is the only person who's ever invented a phantom IL stint, uh, the Dodgers, you know, have done it in the past as well. Um, and so I, I think that it wouldn't shock me if Yamamoto pitches 150 innings this year. Uh, this prediction is not at all influenced by his his first start in Korea. I, I don't care. I think he's a very good pitcher. But I think that he's going to be babied a little bit more by the Dodgers, and I think the Cubs are going to let Imanaga go. And I think Imanaga is a really good pitcher, and I think he is going to miss bats. I know he has some home run issues. Yes, that'll that'll pop up here and there. But I think in terms of fantasy value, his ability to pitch deep into games and throw more innings – will help him get more wins, more strikeouts, and I think they're both going to be solid ratio pitchers. So I think at the end of the year, you're going to look at overall fantasy value on whatever sites calculate that, you know, whether it's like uh, Fangraph's auction value or, you know, Razball or anything like that or just Yahoo Player Raider. Um, and I think Imanaga, my bold prediction is Imanaga will be the more valuable pitcher. I love it. I cannot wait for this Cubs season, by the way. You know they're – they put together a pretty good lineup when Nico Horner is yeah. projected about seventh. I mean, I, I guess that means they believe in Christopher Morrell, who right now is ostensibly the cleanup man. But Hap Suzuki Bellinger is a great one, two, three. Dansby Swanson's second season. And, and also he'll help Imanaga because Dansby, Dansby Swanson is an elite defender. And you, know, you want to be strung up the middle defensively. The Cubs don't have that problem. They're the best team in this division. They're going to win it. And I also think it helps that Imanaga is left-handed too. Because some some guys look, we know lefty on lefty is something we always pay attention to, but there are also some right-handed hitters who don't like hitting against lefties because you just don't see them as often. And he hides the ball well. So he I does very that, well. That will help him. It well. will. You know, here's yeah. the thing, right? Somebody might say, "Oh, well, 
there's an adjustment period for Imanaga, the culture change, and you know, the ball's different and all that. Yeah. And that, that's all true. That's all fair. But when it comes to him learning the hitters and the hitters learning him, I think when when those mysteries are colliding, I think the advantage goes to the pitcher. They haven't seen this guy before. Yeah, and they I agree have to with figure that. out what he's doing. I I think he's a great pick. I I keep missing on him. I think a lot of times in my draft, I'm drafting online. I'm <laughs> drafting in Yahoo, and late in the draft, I'll get a little piece of scratch paper and I'll write like seven or eight targets I don't want to forget about. And maybe I need to bump up that process and focus on it in the middle of my drafts because he's the guy. Even Naga's a guy who won the draft all preseason, and I I may have one share. I'm underweight on him, and I regret that. I think this is a great. If nothing else, e- even if you don't agree all the way with Eric's take, if you have a draft coming up, I, I want you to draft this guy. I want you, I want you to be in on the Cubs this year. They're they're going to win this division. We got more old predictions coming, but before we do that, uh, the Premier League race is tightening. And one of the most important matches of the season is this Sunday when Manchester City takes on Arsenal. As the Gunners try to claim their first title in 20 years, watch the matchup at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, only on NBC and Peacock. That's 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, only on NBC and Peacock. Um, And then you can just carry that right into Sunday baseball. Um, So that's a nice full day of sports. Um, I know you, you know, mentioned some, some, pulled some, poured some cold water on the Yankees um, Mm -hmm. earlier in this podcast. You and I are both going to highlight somebody on the Yankees. We do believe in Um, my bold prediction, which it's not as bold as my last one, but um, I think labor Torres finishes as a top three second baseman in fantasy this year. Um, as of right now, obviously the top three are Marcus Simeon, Ozzy Albies, and Jose Altuve. Um, it becomes a little bit more muddled after that. You know, you've got Nico Horner. You used to have Matt McClain. There's Zach Geloff and Cattell Marte, and you know Glaber Torres in there. I think Glaber Torres is, is in the top three. Um, I think he is being a little bit underrated right now because we look at his happy fun ball season where he hit you know thirty plus home runs, and we think, oh, he's not that guy, and he and he's not that guy. But he is a 2020 guy. Um, I think he's going to hit for a good average. I think he'll be in the middle of what maybe won't be an elite lineup, but will still be a solid lineup. There will be runs. There will be RBIs. Um, I I think this is a really well-rounded player, and I think he might be one of the top two, three hitters on the Yankees, right? Judge Soto, and then I think it's probably Glaber Torres. Um, And... So I, I'm fully in on Glaber Torres this year. Unfortunately, in a lot of my earlier drafts, I was making a decision between McLean and Glaber Torres, and I chose Matt McLean because I liked the dual position eligibility and I liked the potential speed upside. Um, obviously, with the injury, that wound up not being the way to go. But but I think Glaber Torres is in for a good season. Um, and you think one of his teammates is in for a good season? I do. You, you know, the uh, my colleagues at Yahoo do a college sports podcast they have a segment called say something nice where they talk and they snark and they make fun of stuff and it's like okay now we're going to say something nice and i know all i've done this preseason is to tell you not to draft these yankees we're going to say something nice and i love that torres pick he's he's a little post hypey and that people know he's good but he was a hot prospect as you said he had that happy fun ball season took a step back and now he's screened by whenever we talk yankees it's cole it's they just traded for soto obviously aaron judge they all dominate this program, if you will. And Glaber Torres is, I think it's a little bit, he's a little bit of a boring guy now, even though he's still in his twenties. I'm going to talk about an exciting young player. Now, Anthony Volpe, I get it. He hit 209, but that, or that batting average was unlucky. If you go by any of the stat cast data, his batting average should have been 20 to 25 points higher. And he already showed he has category juice. I mean, he went 2020 last year. And I talked about how weak this lineup is. If he shows any, he's not a 209 hitter. I mean, he, he, hit from uh, 263 average in the minors. I think that's a reasonable target area for him, maybe even a little bit higher as he becomes a more seasoned veteran. I mean, he's entering his age 23 season. If he shows any improvement at all, he moves up in this lineup. The category juice plays already. I have him. They want a gold glove as a rookie too. I have Anthony Volpe charting as a top 10 MVP player by the end of the season. Yeah, I, I – was I still think he's probably going to hit around 250, but that's much better than he hit last year mm-hmm. when he hit uh 209. I think the swing change for him this spring has there been good. Go. Um, 
I think it has expedited some of his progression a little bit more than I thought. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm in on Anthony Volpe. Um, speaking of swing changes, my bold prediction, which it isn't super bold, but it's just kind of like planting a flag in a, in a player that I really like. Um, I think Brian Hayes is going to go 2020 this year. Now, uh, the reason why that's bold-ish is that he's never hit more than 15 home runs in a season. Um, he stole 10 bases last year, but he did steal 20 in 2022. So I think 20 bases is within his range of outcomes. I believe in the power we saw at the end of last season when he changed his swing. He added a toe tap. He started pulling and lifting the ball a little bit more. He hit 10 home runs in 49 games to end the season. Um, and so I think that we've seen that kind of carry over in the spring where he's hitting the ball hard. Um, and so I believe we're going to see the best power and speed season out of, out of Key Brian Hayes. We've been wanting it for a while, but he's still 27 years old, right? He's entering his athletic peak when it comes to baseball players. Um, and so I, I think we're going to see a really good season out of him. I've been trying to get as many shares as I can. And so uh, 2020 for Brian Hayes. I love it. Uh, on one of our earlier podcasts, you did a really deep dive and got granular with some of the Hayes data and you had me moving them up. I wish this lineup had a little bit more length, but the top of it is good. And Hayes is going to bat third. He's also an elite defender and he's one of the smartest players in the game. And I always feel Bill James would talk about the smartest players I think maybe he meant the smartest pitchers, but I, I always think I, I want to bet on somebody who is working constantly to improve their craft and trying to reevaluate what's my process. And I feel like that describes Brian Hayes. I'm, I'm certainly in on him. Okay, look, the Angels. Here's a fun stat, okay? The, the Otani era is over in Anaheim. So Mike Trout and Shohei Otani were teammates for six years, and we all know they didn't make the playoffs. Eric, they didn't have a winning record in any of those yeah. seasons, which is just mind blowing. And I, everybody knows baseball, you need a lot of good players. Two isn't going to cut it. That's, that, that, there's no surprise to that. But I didn't realize I didn't even go, they didn't win 82 crummy games one year. But so it's like, and I'm telling people not to draft Mike Trout. But is there something to draft here? Yeah, I think Zach Mayo. Not, 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 uh, Zach Mayo, Zach Neto. Zach Mayo was an officer and a gentleman. Do not draft Richard Gere. <laughs> he's, he's no longer relevant. Deborah Winger, I would still keep in the keeper league. But uh, Zach Neto, first round pedigree, comes up last year. He's a little bit like the Volpe case, right? Because the batting average wasn't good. But in about a half season, he hit nine home runs. He stole five bases. And his what he showed, his raw speed, I see no reason. Ron Washington wants to run like crazy. I see no reason why Neto can't get the 20 steals. And the power already showed up last year. So the bold prediction... Mm -hmm is going to be Zach Neto goes 2020. But here's what I'm looking at, right? He's going to start the year in the bottom of the order. They don't want to put a lot of pressure on him. But this lineup's so bad that it, I, I swear it's going to take like two or three good games for Zach Neto to get to the top of this order. Again, it's a weak lineup, whatever. When we're talking about guys who are, are going to be this type of fantasy profile, you need the extra at-bats. He's eventually going to be, I think, the second-best offensive player on this team. So it's coming. You can get him so cheap in Yahoo drafts. Not Zach Mayo. I want you to draft Zach Neto. He's going 2020 in his second season. Um, I had the exact same bold prediction when you emailed and said Zach Neto 2020. So uh, I I fully co-signed this. Um, I have a lot of shares of him. I um, I did a video of. I probably stole. Him. I probably stole this from you. I'm just co-opting. No, it's, take, it's but whatever. perfect. Though. It's it's uh, if you follow uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's uh, at Samolski underscore sports. I do a lot of you know Instagram videos on players you should pick up or drop or whatever. Um, and Zach Neto was one of my last like you know go get this guy in the late round of your of your drafts. Um, fully in on him. Um, I did an article at the beginning of the off season that was called who's the next Josh Lowe, which looked at like a well-regarded prospect who didn't really fare well in his first, uh, from a fantasy perspective, didn't really fare well in his first taste of, of the big leagues, who I think will have a much better second season. Um, and Zach Neto was my backup choice. He was my number two choice behind my next bold prediction. My top choice was Parker Meadows. Um, I believe Parker Meadows, my bold prediction is Parker Meadows finishes the season as a top 40 outfielder, um, you're the Tigers guy, and I'm talking about all the Tigers players. But this is a guy who um, I ha has been a solid uh, prospect coming up, not you know a, somebody with like tons of pedigree, um, but was a pretty solid player. Uh, slugged you know 474 with an 812 uh, OPS in AAA, which is fine, not great, but I think that he you know. 
pulls the ball enough, lifts the ball enough to get to enough power. He has 90th percentile sprint speed. Um, he stole eight bases and nine attempts in his 37 MLB games, and he stole 19 bases and 21 attempts in AAA. I think he can definitely get to 20 stolen bases, if not more. Um, in fact, he's only been thrown out five times in 44 attempts in his two minor league seasons, so he's a really efficient um, base runner. He never hit over 275 in AA or AAA, so I don't think you're getting a 280 average, but I think you could get a 260 hitter with 15 home runs and 20 plus steals um, while hitting at the top of a lineup. He's going to be hit leadoff for Detroit. Um, and that's a lineup that I think is better than some people expect. And so I think Parker Meadows um, is a top 40 fantasy outfielder at the end of the year. And I'll also just add in here. I, th- I had to mention uh, Lawrence Butler is a guy that both DJ short and I have been like, you know, talking about in a lot of bold predictions recently. I said Lawrence Butler, top 40 outfielder. Um, that's super bold. He might end up top 50. He's being drafted outside the top 600 right now. So uh, let's even call it a top 50 outfielder. Makes it a bold prediction. Uh, this is a guy who I think now has a starting job in Oakland. Um, Estre Ruiz was a terrible defender last year. It looks like Oakland um, in the last few spring lineups has not been using him in the starting lineup. They may have decided Estre Ruiz is Billy Hamilton and will be a fourth outfielder and and pinch runner and whatever. Um, That could open up a starting spot for Lawrence Butler. Lawrence Butler is somebody who has gotten better every time he repeats a level in the minors. He's started to do that already in the spring this year with much better plate discipline than he showed in the rookies. Um, in his rookie season, he had 111 max EV. He had a 9% barrel rate um, last year as a rookie. So he hit the ball hard. Um, the issues were with his plate discipline. And I really believe if he gets that going, this is a guy who has enough pop to pull and lift the ball and get, you know, 15 plus home runs. Um, I think if I, he improved a lot at AAA last year. So I think there's, if he carries that over and the improvements we saw in spring, he could like Parker Meadows hit 250, 260, hit 20 home runs. Um, He had 21 steals and 15 home runs in the minors. So there's an also some 2020 upside or 15 homer, 20 steal upside here to go with that 250 batting average. If he gets full playing time, I think Lawrence Butler's a, a guy that you're going to roster on the Oakland A's. It's not just going to be Zach Gella. I love it. And the big takeaway to that, too, is to please do not draft Estuary Ruiz. He's a specialist. He's good at one thing. And he is not, as you mentioned, his defense. And de- Why do we talk about defense? I mean, a defense is important for a pitcher and stuff like that. But when somebody is fringy with his offensive contributions, he better be a great defender. And Ruiz is not. I he's undraftable for me. I've not, not once have I looked at his name when it's been at the top of the queue. I'm like, Oh yeah. History Ruiz. Even when I need stolen bases, I'll attack it a different way. And maybe Lawrence yeah. Butler is the guy. And, and you know, the A's aren't good, but last year Rooker had maybe three months of sure. value and, and Geloff was really good at the second half of the year. I talked about how depressing the angels are, but somebody, you know, maybe Brandon Drury will have a nice season. Maybe Neto will do some of the stuff we're talking about. There's fantasy value in every city. And this fantasy value in the A's, just please don't draft Ruiz. My next one, I didn't even have it on the rundown, and then it popped in my head. I have to talk about Cutter Crawford because his global ADP is starting pitcher 73, and he's so set up to beat that. He was good last year, okay? Here's the thing. You always talk about ERA estimators, and I'm curious which one of the if Sierra is your go-to. I, I try to look at all of them and, and maybe just come to a consensus or somewhere in the middle with the median, but – Last year, Cutter Crawford, 4.04 ERA, but the FIP was 3.83. Struck out better than a batter per inning. His walks were in a reasonable rate. And what do we look for in spring training? Walks and strikeouts? He's got two walks and 18 strikeouts. He's relief pitcher eligible. He's starter pitcher eligible. I think the Red Sox are going to be a little better than we expect. At least they're going to finish ahead of the Yankees, probably like an 83 to 85 win team. And Maybe there's no ace on the staff. But there's like a lot of like solid starting pitcher three type of guys. I'm talking major league, not fantasy for that. But Cutter Crawford is so set up. If he's healthy, he smashes his ADP. I want you yeah. to, to write down the name Cutter Crawford, draft him as one of your you know, late picks, and then smile all season when he's in your starting lineup every week. Fully, I agree with that as well. I have Cutter Crawford in a, in a lot of places. Um, you talk about Esther Ruiz. 
My last bold prediction for the show is somebody who is tangentially connected to Esther Ruiz because he's also very fast. Here we go. Um, and it's the aforementioned Victor Scott. I think Victor Scott finishes in the top three of the NL Rookie of the Year voting. Um, obviously, Yamamoto and Shota Imanaga are Rookie of the Year eligible because they are um, – they're rookies for Major League Baseball, so uh, they are very kind of like consensus top choices. Um, you have Jackson Churio with um, the Brewers, who's a consensus top choice. Uh, Jung Ho Lee for the Giants, Mason Wynn, Gavin Stone, DL Hall, uh, Yuki Matsui. Like there are lots of guys who have um, NL Rookie of the Year award odds that are higher than Victor Scott. Some of that is that uh, Osaka. Kyle Harrison, even Paul Skeens, Jackson Merrill, uh, Jared Jones, so many guys above um, Victor Scott. Part of that was that Victor Scott was sent down um, to the minors, and I really don't think that this is an indication that the, the Cardinals felt he wasn't ready. It was that the Cardinals had a lot of veteran outfield depth. They didn't want to start Victor Scott's prospect clock um, you know, too soon if they didn't need it. Then they needed him. Um, and this is a situation where I think that if Scott – plays well, they're not going to send him back down. They, the genie is out of the bottle, so to speak, and I don't think that you send him down if he has comported himself well at the major league level. So I think Scott will be like, have Jordan Walker level at bats, if not more, this year. Um, and why I mentioned Esther Ruiz is that Scott stole 94 bases in the minors last year, so people have kind of amounted him to, oh, he's Esther Ruiz. And I don't believe that that's the case. I know that Esther Ruiz had a great 2022 season in the minors that he split between double A and triple A. That was his only season as a, as a plus hitter. Um, he was really bad in 2019 and 2021. He was not good in the majors last year. So Esther Ruiz has one good year as a hitter. Victor Scott has gotten continuously better. We've seen improvement in the AFL this off season. We saw improvement in spring training. I believe Victor Scott has much better plate discipline. Um, he makes a lot more contact. He doesn't draw a lot of walks, uh, but he has a, a really good contact profile. So I think that he makes more contact, and I like his approach at the plate better than Estre Ruiz. I don't think either one of them is a power hitter, but I believe that Victor Scott is slowly getting to gap-to-gap -gap power a little bit more than Estre Ruiz will do as a major league player. And then the key, like what you talked about, Victor Scott is a good defensive outfielder. Um, he is going to play for the Cardinals because he can play a good center field. So that will keep him on the field in a way that Esther Ruiz will not be kept on the field by his defense for Oakland. So I don't think you're going to get a lot of power out of Victor Scott, but I think you're going to get a decent enough batting average with speed. He doesn't, he doesn't have to steal first because he can get on base, and I think you're going to get good speed. And if Victor Scott plays well and stays up all season for the Cardinals – I think he could steal 40-plus bases with a solid batting average, and I think that will put him at the top of the NL Rookie of the Year contention. If you are thinking about rostering him for fantasy, just acknowledge this is a guy who will give you a, I think will give you a solid batting average and will give you good steals, but will chip in with runs and RBIs and not give you that much of a you know home run upside. So I am in on him as a real-life player this year because I think he has the skills to, to stick. But I don't think that you're going to get full five-category fantasy upside um, out of him. Love it. I know you were talking about Victor Scott during our prop episode, and you were like, hey, can we even find some rookie of the year odds? Because he wasn't listed in some shops. But so you were ahead of the Victor Scott curve all along. And, and I want to make it clear. Because some people are probably listening saying, well, wait a minute, you're telling me not to draft Ruiz, who's he was like a mostly a steals guy, but you're saying Victor Scott. The key is Victor Scott, great defender. And I think you undersold his OBP skills. I mean, minor league slash of 290, 367, 419. Right, yes. sure. In the Arizona Fall League, he had more walks than strikeouts. Anytime anybody does that, I know it was 23 games. I don't care. Anytime anybody does that, it makes me tingly. He had five walks against seven strikeouts in the spring. He stole four bases. Victor Scott's a good baseball player who happens to run a lot. He eventually profiles as a leadoff hitter, where Esther Ruiz right now doesn't even profile as a starter on probably the worst team in baseball. That's a great call. Get some Victor Scott in those final drafts. I will close with this. Victor Scott's an exciting young player, and I wish the Cardinals had more of them.
but they have a lot of old players on this team. And I look, I love Paul Goldschmidt and I love Nolan Arenado who actually didn't win a gold glove for the first time last year in, in forever. This team won five. In fact, Joe Sheen pointed this. I know I'm always mentioning Joe, but he's so good. The Cardinals won five gold gloves a couple of years ago. Their defense was actually subpar last year. And I'm just so used to forever. It's like, oh yeah, I want pitchers on the Cardinals. The defense will bail them out. And, and it hurts that they don't have their the healthiest lineup right now because Edmund, who's a very good defender, is not healthy at the moment. But look at this rotation. Michaelis, Zach Thompson, Lance Lynn, Stephen Matz, Kyle Gibson. That's, those should be guys battling for four and five spots. That's actually their entire rotation. They're going to finish last in the NL Central again. That's my, And I don't even know if that's bold because they finished last last season. But I think we're just used to the Cardinals. They're, they're voodoo. They'll, they'll figure things out. Yeah, that voodoo maybe is running out. You notice uh, Adelise Garcia and – and uh, Randy Rosarena conking home runs for other teams. They're former Cardinals. Uh, some they need they need Victor Scott to pop, but they also need some young pitching to pop. It's an old team. It's a foundationally crumbling team. I think the Pirates are better by now. The Reds certainly should be better with all the talent they have. Everybody knows how good the Cubs could be this year. Uh, the, the Brewers maybe the Brewers will finish below the Cardinals. We'll see. But I, I think St. Louis right now is the worst team in this division. Yeah, I have a little more faith in the Cardinals, but I I don't. I agree that. The Reds and Pirates are <clears throat> on the ascent, and the Cubs are better. Um, so I, I think it's fully within the range of outcomes. And again, it's an old team. If they start off flat and they don't appear to be in contention, you know, the team may decide sell off some of these older players and and try to just go, you know, build around some of the younger guys they have coming up, like the Jordan Walkers and the Victor Scotts and um, Thomas Segesi and, you know, whatever, some of the young Can you draft players. any of these starting pitchers? I mean, I, I look, and I'll only have Kyle I, well, Gibson, I, whatever. I, I love Sonny Gray. Um, so I, okay, I will yeah, Gray will eventually Gray. come back, and that's a big thing. They, yeah. And they drafted him basically to be the front man, so I, yeah. that's totally fair. But but I think that's it for me. Like, I will take some late shares of, of Lance Lynn in deeper formats because – uh, he left Maybe, a mark last why year. Not? I, I can't but, do I mean, it. I can't. If I'm just too tepid on this, that's fine. But yeah. even going to the Dodgers last year didn't save Lance Lynn. I, I think it's over for him. I really do. It, it's entirely possible. But the answer is that's the only other person that I, I would consider. Mm -hmm. So I, I fully agree with you. Um, those are our bold predictions for 2023. The next time that Scott and I chat next week, we'll be chatting about real Baseball games, games. Uh, the action that that has come for has come, you know, will come to pass this weekend. Um, I will put out an article Thursday morning on NBC Sports. That's my guide for what to watch this weekend for fantasy baseball. So it's just things that I'm watching in each of the the opening series for uh, players who are like have fantasy questions. So it's not like it will not include like, hey, you should watch Corbin Burns start. Like those guys, we we know what they are. Um, I'm, you know, questions about uh, lineup spots or how bullpens are deployed or is this guy going to platoon? The, you know, I'll kind of list all those things. So hopefully you can use that as a resource in the weekend to kind of say, OK, these were some things we were watching for. Does it impact um, our decision making for, you know, our first fab run or second fab run or whatever on, on Sunday night? Um, so you can check that out on NBCSports.com. Or you can follow us on Twitter. Um, I will tweet that article out on uh, Thursday morning. I am on Twitter at Samsky NYC. Scott is on Twitter at Scott underscore Pianowski. And we'll see you next week to talk about real baseball games on the Roto World Baseball Show. <laughs>